Yeah, so we've got a, a group of, or a very diverse group of uh, young professionals today um, who, who all have a lot of the skills that uh, panel one just went over. So um, I'm just going to jump right into it and allow them to introduce themselves, give us a bit of a background on, you know, where, where they came from, what they're doing now, um, and how they got there. So uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll kick it off here with Richard. Uh, Richard, do you want to give us a, a bit of a sense of um, what you're working on now and, and what it took to get you to where you are? Uh, thanks, Brendan. Uh, yeah, my name is Richard Harris, and uh, I'm the principal of carbon management at uh, a global energy advisory called Spruill here based in Calgary. My background is in uh, engineering. My undergrad's in chemical engineering, but I've spent 14 years or so in various roles in uh, EMP companies. So from operations engineering to development, exploitation, M&A, um, most of it, however, has been uh, related to subsurface. So reservoir engineering I spent five years actually in Aberdeen working as a reservoir engineer over there. Um, but I, uh, I came back to Calgary and had a brief period of unemployment, like many have. And uh, it caused, uh, caused me to have this period of self-reflection. And uh, in that period, I've uh, found my way into uh, carbon management and, and now here at, uh, at Sproul. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and Sophie, I think we'll uh, move over to you next. Um, hi, my name is Sophie. Um, my background is in finance and economics. I did my undergraduate degree in finance at the University of Lethbridge, and I did my MBA at the University of Calgary. Um, I'm mostly focused on sustainable finance, environmental, social, and governance uh, performance, and on emerging fuels like hydrogen. Um, I'm a market analyst at the Canada Energy Regulator, and the two main aspects of my job is to produce um, neutral and unbiased energy information for Canadians, and to participate in hearings for energy products project applications. Um, so I analyze lots of data and different indicators. I write reports on trends and issues in the oil and gas industry. Um, on hearings, I evaluate the supply and demand justification for whatever the project is for. And I monitor and collect information um, on exports to capital investment in the industry, um, commodity prices and production. Um, before I was at the energy regulator, I was a financial analyst at the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Um, prior to that, I was at uh, the Bank of Canada as a research assistant in both of those, um, doing similar things, um, data and taking that data and finding a way to communicate it to leadership and uh, other stakeholders. Excellent. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, and Larry, over to you. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, I'm Larry De Silva. I'm a remediation advisor with TC Energy. Uh, so I help manage, mitigate, assess, and investigate um, the risks associated with contamination and any problems of or risks of harm that they may pose to environment or human health. Um, for a background, I completed my undergrad in environmental science at University of Calgary. So a lot of courses on yeah anything environmental related. So um, water chemistry, soil chemistry, hydrology, eco hydrology. Um, statistics, different quantitative methods. Um, during my time in undergrad, I worked at AMEC. It's a consulting company, which has since been acquired by the Wood Group. Um, but there I had a lot of exposure in the contaminated sites uh, field and uh, helped support a lot of the uh, oil sands operations, construction projects and different um, commercial projects within Calgary and the surrounding area. Uh, I followed that by completing my master's degree in toxicology at the University of Saskatchewan. So a lot more um, in-depth knowledge and understanding, so understanding chemicals, contaminants, how they might move in the environments and how people and different animals can be exposed and um, what that kind of harm can look like and trying to determine, again, when is chemical actually a contaminant versus when can we leave it there because it doesn't pose any risk and it's just we're spending money on nothing to clean it up. Um, following that, I worked for a consulting company. Um, helping again conduct human health and ecological risk assessments of chemicals um, for different spill sites. And uh, this is mainly in Alberta, but it stretched uh, supporting projects across uh, most of the prairies. And following that, yeah, I've worked for TC Energy for the last few years and um, it's been great working uh, on a lot of operations across Canada. Excellent, thank you. Um, Mac, we'll uh, move over to you next. 
Awesome. Hello, everybody. I always like to open up with a just an acknowledgement and recognize where I live and work and play, which is on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes Siksika, Kainai, Pukani, Sutsuna, uh, the Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Region 3, all within the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I always like to also acknowledge my grandmother, who's from Heart Lake First Nation in the Treaty 6 region of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and the uh, Nakota Sioux. I always like to take a little a moment and acknowledge her. It's just I would not be where I am today without her strength and her guidance. Um, my career started really young. I started with um, on the service side with a drilling company and neighbors drilling at a crisp age of 17 turning 18. <laughs> so, and I grew there for through that company um, right up until we uh, sold, the company sold and I went on to work in the field started all the way up in Fort St. John and worked my way all the way down in a truck down to Brooks, Milk River. And then now I'm with uh, Streamflow as the in Indigenous Engagement Advisor and Streamflow is a wellhead, um, wellhead check valves and chokes uh, manufacturer servicing company leading edge. Uh, we actually manufacture everything local, which is one of the big things I really like about Streamflow is everything's here in Canada. Um, I was previously the vice chair of the Calgary Stampede First Nations Princess Program and nominee for the Western Legacy Award in 2019, and then was a speaker for the uh, National Coalition of Chiefs uh, in 2018 in Vancouver. And then aside from uh, helping with Streamflow, and I volunteer my time with Avatar Innovations, which if you haven't heard of Avatar, you'll need to get yourself familiarized with it because it is definitely a program that is up and coming. Andy <laughs> can vouch for me on that one. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a little background on who I am. Excellent. Thanks, Mac. And uh, without further ado, over to Andy then. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Brendan. So uh, my name is Andy Kujakian. I'm very excited to be here with you all today for this uh, important discussion. Um, I work as a data science engineer at a company called Tyne Energy here in Calgary. Uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, Tyne Energy is a private E&P company that operates uh, mostly out of uh, Southern Saskatchewan. Um, in my role, I help assist uh, basically all things innovation and efficiency based. So that can mean automating processes that don't need to be done manually anymore. It can mean, uh, you know, applying advanced analyses, uh, sometimes called machine learning and others to help drive decisions uh, more effectively and more quickly. Um, and it can also mean, you know, uh, just streamlining uh, business intelligence stuff uh, where it needs to be uh, streamlined, uh, displaying things like IoT or uh, Internet of Things sensors across our many thousand sites um, to engineers so that they can, you know, focus their efforts to the areas that matter most. Um, before my role at Tyne, though, uh, I pursued a and completed a degree in computer engineering at the University of British Columbia. Um, I'm also currently pursuing a master's degree in data science and information at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and I had very, a few other roles, all in energy, um, including working with the petroleum and uh, electrical engineering departments at the University of Calgary. Uh, I worked at a measurement while drilling engineering firm in Calgary, doing some firmware development for them. And I also did a brief stint with Shell Canada uh, working as a computer engineer tying large data sets together uh, <laughs> to similar effect as my current position uh, or current job, uh, you know, help drive uh, decisions more effectively and quickly. So yeah, really looking forward to uh, talking with you all today. Thanks, Andy. So yeah, I, as everyone can now see, we have quite the uh, diverse range of uh, skill sets on the call with us today. Um, and a lot of different paths that uh, that folks have taken to work in the industry um, and in a variety of different positions. So I think the what what always struck me, especially uh, trying to choose a career path, is you hear a lot of job titles and no one really knows exactly what that means um, and what a day in the life really looks like. So that, I think that's what I, I'd like to hear from all of you about next is kind of what is a day in the life uh, in, in your position? What kind of skills do you put to use every day? Um, and, uh, and maybe any, any skills that you're, you're looking to develop or that your organizations are, are looking for you to develop uh, for, for kind of the future of, of your position. Um, and maybe because I know the least about it, Andy, we'll just go right back to you and see what, uh, what does a data engineer do? Sure, yeah. Uh, 
No problem. Happy, happy to clarify. <laughs> so, um, you know, just talking about the skills that, that I would use day to day, you know, I, I have uh, daily meetings with my team where we go over, um, you know, projects that we've been working on, uh, I guess, for, you know, past weeks and whatever. Um, and those conversations can include, you know, technical challenges uh, that revolve around programming. So, you know, that's things like, okay, I am having this issue with Python. Sometimes the people in our organization are still learning some of these skills, like I think the past or the previous uh, panel had, uh, you know, talked about. So we can talk about, yeah, you know, how do I figure this out? I'm having, I'm getting this error. How do I solve that? Um, it's also a lot of statistics. So, you know, uh, applying mathematics through programming uh, in order to drive uh, insights. Um, it's also, you know, a fair amount of domain knowledge to energy. You know, any monkey can program or do math, but without the context, it's all meaningless. So you have to definitely understand the business itself, um, which I've learned, uh, you know, only through working in the industry. Um, and then I'd say for sure, one of the, if not the most important skill I use day to day is, uh, you know, communication, <laughs> unsurprisingly, uh, talking with stakeholders, you know, going to, um, you know, a geologist, because in my role, I work with geologists, I work with accountants, I work with uh, engineers, uh, understanding their problems or their specific use case that they're trying to tackle. Um, so being able to communicate with them, understand their issue, so that I can go back, solve it, and then also being able to go back and communicate the results afterwards, <laughs> and all throughout. Um, so yeah, I'd say, you know, programming, math, communication, uh, <laughs> Those are probably the, the, the most uh, important things I do day to day. Um, and in terms of you know skills I'd like to, to get better at, uh, I think kind of in the same vein of communication um, would be change management. Uh, you know, in innovation, uh, change is uh, inherent, and uh, <laughs> being able to manage change in others, but also in yourself, in such an ever changing environment is, is extremely important. So I'm always trying to manage that as well. So ho hopefully that provided a little bit of clarity for you, Brent. No, absolutely. absolutely. Um, the, the, the interesting thing that, uh, that you said there too, though, is that a lot of the, the knowledge you need regarding the energy industry is not necessarily anything that you picked up in a in formal education. Um, it's all on the job. So is that through, you know, courses offered by your company or is it, uh, you know, drinking from the fire hose on your first couple of weeks and, uh, and just trying to figure it out for me personally it was drinking through the fire hose for sure uh, you know whether uh yeah being assigned a project that seems daunting at first and just wading through it or you know going out and getting to know some of your coworkers socially and not being afraid to ask them the, the questions that you might feel stupid to otherwise um but yeah for sure it was not in school it was on the job <laughs> excellent uh, Sophie, so you, uh, you've got a, a financial background, um, which obviously can take you into a bunch of different industries, but you have landed in energy. Um, so what does uh, a day in the life of a market analyst at the Canadian Energy Regulator look like? And how are you kind of putting to, to use your, your skills that you've developed uh, working in finance? Yeah, I would say a typical day for me, there's normally multiple projects on the go. And so those projects will consist of um, internal projects, so briefing leadership on different events that are happening in the sector and how that's impacting uh, regulated companies by the CER, um, and then also writing public reports for consumption by the Canadian public, and so um, putting together um, information that covers either an event or trends or a specific commodity that, so that people have a place they can go to to learn about the oil and gas industry. Um, and then there's also sitting on hearings. So companies will submit uh, projects for um, energy projects and we will listen to company arguments um, and evidence from other parties on whether or not um, that project should be built or not. And, and so we look at it from a financial and economic perspective on my team of, is there supply for this project? If it's a pipeline that a company is trying to build, is there adequate supply and, and is there adequate demand? Will that pipeline be useful? And so in order to answer that question, you've really got to be up to date on supply and demand and the economics of the sector. So a lot of my job is reading news articles, is listening to company earning calls and 
digesting different forecasts and looking at those assumptions and trying to put together a picture of what it all means and, and having an understanding of what the outlook for the sector is. So um, I feel like my job is a permanent student type of position. I'm, I'm doing a lot of research and reading and, uh, and yeah. So I do a lot of collaboration. Anything we do has got to be translated. We've got to work with communications teams. We've got to work with um, people much smarter than me to put it on the website and have it all work properly. So, um, and engagement. Engagement is a big one at the CER is if you're going to produce information on the energy sector, you need to know what people want to know. So we meet with uh, stakeholders constantly to understand what's missing in the space and, and what the CER can provide that would be valuable. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's interesting. I, I also have, took a lot of finance courses in, in uh, university and you, you never quite end up doing exactly what people think you're going to do with those courses uh, by the time you're done. So um, no, that's great. Um, Larry, maybe we'll go over to you. So um, you, uh, you started in environmental science and toxicology, and now you're at TransCanada. Um, what's, uh, what does a site remediation specialist do day to day? Yeah, um, I, and I guess I'll probably touch on a lot of similar points as both Sophie and Andy did during theirs. Um, so it's essentially you need just environmental chemistry knowledge to understand if there was a historical oil spill that we've now found out when we have operations out there and they're maybe conducting hydrovac activities, um, what that really could have come from or where it could be going. Can we actually clean it up right away if we can't clean it up and we have to go back later, we have to inform CER about that and they're responsible for every year checking up on us and we obviously on our own are going and assessing, investigating and when we can remediating whatever that spill is. Um, so I'd say from the most technical standpoint, environmental chemistry was probably the most um, school-based skill that I could still carry forward. Um, but on skills that I had to learn on the job was during my consulting days, hydrogeology and the modeling associated with that was again, just drinking straight from the fire hose of it is, was a completely brand new um, mindset and skill set to have to try and learn just such a technical um, standpoint. So um, I think it really is just hard work when we're once here in the industry of just committing to learning every day and still continuing to be a student as Sophie mentioned. Um, and then on the soft skill perspective, as Andy mentioned, uh, communication, it's just really so important, whether that's verbal or written is, can you communicate your ideas to whoever needs to hear that? Is it your stakeholders, leadership. Um, we have to work with our lawyers to actually make sure that we're addressing points that if they need to be made to our regulator or our landowners, um, maybe our land agents. So again, just being able to, and especially technical jargon down to a language that everyone can understand because if, if they don't know what you're saying, it's really meaningless. So um, I think uh, to add to the skills also that are always worth developing, it's communication, both written and verbal. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, anybody that's worked in energy uh, knows it's uh, it's acronym central, and <laughs> it's a whole different language. You need to learn pretty well to to communicate with uh, with any of your stakeholders. Um, Mac, maybe we'll go to you next. Um, um, you've had a different uh, pathway to to your position now than most of the other folks have on the on the call. So I'm curious, kind of what skill development looked like for you, um, and and exactly what which which skills you make you most most use of uh, in your in your day to day, and I know you wear a bunch of different hats. So, uh, in any of yeah. them, really. <laughs> my role's so much different, and it's like crazy because honestly, as long as I've got my legs and my feet, I can keep moving, which means I can keep getting my job done. <laughs> so, but besides actually being a huge communication role, um, it's also being present. Um, mine's actually getting out a lot. Obviously, with COVID, it's been a little bit of a struggle, but actually getting out into the communities and being there and making a bridge between energy and indigenous and having that being able to create opportunities and relationships and growing it together is such a big part of my day I am on the phone 24 7 I'm talking all the time <laughs> it's definitely not a weak asset that I have and uh yeah I am like the communications and email like it's been I guess obviously with changing times it's same thing it's adapting to getting on the video calls or having being back and forth with emails but I'd have to definitely focus on the fact that the communication actually being present is such a big part of my my job from being in sales all the way into the indigenous engagement advisor um yeah you got to be in those communities unless you know how they're living and working and playing then 
it's it's hard to relate. So being there, being present for sure, which hopefully will get easier soon. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting. This is kind of a, a a throwback to our first panel. There, where they were talking a lot about what what skills are have have always been around and will continue to be, and very clearly, communications is is at the top of that list. Um, and Richard, I'm pretty sure you're going to have something similar to say as well. But uh, why don't we uh, go over to you next? And what's uh, what's a, a day in the life look like for you? Uh, well, first, first, day in the life of a principal, I'm still trying to figure out what a principal does. Or, uh, <laughs> my, my nephews think I work at an elementary school. So anyway, so we, um, so I, like as principal car management, it, I look after the whole car management business. So that starts from, you know, business development. So meeting with clients, writing proposals. So again, communication is critical. Um, so a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time uh, preparing documents, um, a lot of uh, marketing. So writing kind of thought pieces, case studies, um, podcast interviews, those types of things um, to uh, help market Sproul and the services we offer. Um, then there's the actual work bit. So I there's any given day, there's several projects that I'm managing and, and actually doing work. So modeling reservoirs to economics, um, all get involved in, in the job. And then uh, at the end of it, if there's any time left in the week, um, I'm still doing a bit of research on the side with, um, with the University of Calgary. So um, that helps me sort of keep my ties to the academic world. And I, I think I didn't need to actually say part of my career transition actually involved uh, going back and getting my master's at the University of Calgary, um, doing my master's in sustainable energy development. And that really kind of kicked off my kind of a new career path or allowed me to access um, yeah, another dimension of a career that I, I didn't think I'd, I'd be in. So. Yeah, so it's all of the above, communications, written, verbal skills, and then all, all the way down to science, geology, subsurface knowledge, all things, skills that I've kind of built up through my career, really, that I'm getting to use again, which is great. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. And I, I, uh, <laughs> there, there's going to be a, a few shout outs, I think, during this event to the uh, Sustainable Energy <laughs> Development Program at the UFC. I also took that program. Uh, and uh, we have Sarah Hastings Simon on our next panel as well, who is the uh, director of that program now, too. So um, if anybody's interested, you should check it out. But uh, um, yeah, so I, the, the other question I've got is you know, everybody here is working in energy now. Um, some, of, some of you have. I guess what was a pretty logical um, move into energy, uh, you know, Richard, I know you started off on the engineering side of things and Larry in site remediation kind of from day one, but I'm really curious, it was, was the energy industry always the end game or um, did you kind of happen upon it uh, along the way as, as the panel once said, nobody really has a linear career trajectory these days. So um, maybe because it is the most, uh, the most obvious one, Richard, <laughs> just start back with you again. So was, was energy always the end game? Um, you know, I, I know you've kind of switched what part of it you're working in, but uh, yeah, did you see yourself ending up here from the beginning or yeah. how did well, it Well, I, I noticed that you, you said it was energy, not oil and gas. And at the beginning of my career, uh, when I graduated in, I don't know, it been 2006, from my undergrad, it was in, definitely an oil and gas industry here, here in Calgary, not an energy industry. In, in Calgary so um, and that's what young engineers did at the time they went into oil and gas because there was money um, you could get a good salary and and at the time you could see a long healthy career right and uh, and like and no fault to my thinking at the time might maybe it was a bit naive but um, yeah I could could see kind of this career path like you know you get promotions you know go up to middle management and you know, maybe make it to a vice president and that's your career, right? That's, and that's happened for many, many people um, in, in Calgary. And it's only in the last sort of decade and in this period where I couldn't find a job that it sort of really forced me to look at, um, you know, what is oil and gas mean? What does energy mean? And where can I, um, where do my skills complement kind of the future of energy? And, and that's how I kind of fell into 
um, card management with, with a bit of luck. I have to say there was a bit of luck in there as well. Yeah, th there always is, right? Um, Mac, I'm, I'm curious in yours as well. I know you started pretty well in the, uh, the oil and gas industry right from day one too, as you mentioned. So was that always your intention or did you think you were going to stick it out in energy for the long run or how did, how did your I career path play out? Always loved. Well, at the time, same with Richard, at the time it was oil and gas. Um, coming from a family that all the way back to my great uncles and grandparents all grew up in oil and gas. Um, back even to banister drilling days for those that are on the call that would know who they are. Um, I've always loved oil and gas energy, everything about it. There's nothing that I'm steering clear of it. I'm sticking right through it to the end. <laughs> um, it's near and dear to my heart. I wouldn't have what I have today. I wouldn't have the energy, the passion, the love for the environment because of if it wasn't for energy. And um, yeah, I don't, I had a little thought of steering away from it one time. And I had one of my mentors downtown Calgary, um, Mark kind of steered me right back into it. He's like, nope, you're going to stick with energy and you're going to stick with us for a long time. And I'm glad I did. There's some, yeah, it's definitely a roller coaster sometimes, but man, if you have passion for it, you can go anywhere. Like you can do anything. And, and honestly, you can click and change at any point. If I want to become a data engineer and I don't have an engineering background, there's somebody downtown around here that'll help me out to do so. And I can go that way if I want to. So it, it, you can really take it wherever you need to. And yeah, there's, there's, I'm like, so bred into it. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> so straight from day one for you. Yeah, straight from day one. And I actually, I had an opportunity to go to university. At, I had several scholarships on the line. And I saw somebody working the rigs and that's what I wanted. And I chased after it and I stuck with it. Um, ended up taking, I'm still taking my schooling now. So I've been lucky enough to be able to get into a career path that allows me to do school at the same time. And so I've got a little bit of best of both worlds. So while everybody was in university, I was out chasing rigs. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's a, an important message too. I know we've got uh, a bunch of, of postgrads on the call here today, but um, that you can you can really get into this uh, sector with with just about anything, um, a little bit of hard work, and and you're uh, and you're in. So um, yeah, so since you said uh, you could find a, a data scientist to, or engineer to to help you out, I guess we'll go over to Andy because maybe he's that guy. So. Um, <laughs> Anytime, uh, feel free. Um, so Andy, I guess, yeah, data, data engineering can go a bunch of different ways. Um, you know, I, on the call earlier, we were talking, uh, Dave was bringing up how, you know, a lot of the uh, energy sector uh, employers are competing with folks like Amazon and Microsoft and the Googles of the world for, for good data folks. So um, was, was energy your end game or, uh, or did you kind of find it along the way? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, um, I would say that my route to my current position in energy or, or, or my current specific job for that matter uh, was not conventional. Um, I'm trained as like essentially a software engineer, um, which is not the same as data science, right? It's like pure programming, like uh, signing software project uh, products, not doing analytics and insights. Um, and I would say that the vast majority of my cohort that I graduated with from undergrad ended up working uh, at Microsoft, at Amazon, at various other tech companies, either in Silicon Valley or even in Vancouver or other places within Canada. Um, there are a myriad of reasons that I chose to come uh, into the energy industry. Um, first of all, I'm uh, Calgary born and raised, except for those four years I spent in Vancouver. Um, so I was exposed to it, maybe like Mac and others. Um, and so I, I knew about it. I had an advantage of knowing about it from that avenue. Uh, some of the positions I mentioned that I had at the U of C and that engineering firm and other places uh, had given me some of that domain knowledge I had mentioned that I didn't get uh, from my degree, <clears throat> although I was still applying the same skills. And I, I should mention that the skills that I gained from my degree were instrumental in helping me do my job, but they weren't enough to do it, to, like, to do 100% of it. Um, or to, to do it effectively. Um, 
another <laughs> big reason I, I decided to stay uh, or to come into energy was uh, because I wanted to stay in Canada and not go to the U.S. And at the time, a lot of the, the good jobs uh, were in the U.S. And I was a strong believer and I was taught to, to keep the, the brain power in Canada. So that, that's a, a big reason for me. Um, and then uh, also, to, to be honest, I was I, I knew that there was a lot of opportunity uh, for tech jobs. Uh, and I graduated at a lucky time, you know, where there was a lot of opportunity in uh data science, which I could easily pivot to. It's just like an ex it's adjacent, but different to okay. software engineering. And so I, I found a niche in which I could be different and, you know, potentially have more opportunities um, than those that went to, you know, the 40,000 person Microsoft campus where you're competing with all those other people that are very smart. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of a different perspective and it's not right for everybody. Uh, but for me, I derived a lot of pleasure um, out of knowing that I could make a difference in an industry that was lacking uh, in this specific skill set, and also presented me uh, personal opportunities that I might not have been afforded otherwise. So yeah, I think um, if I were to sum it up, I would say I was trying to be different, um, <laughs> and I was trying to find something that uh, made me fulfilled. Which I know uh, they also talked about in the past uh, panel about trying to give that to young people today. Um, and I, I definitely had that experience in, in my my role. So yeah, um, basically, I knew energy wasn't what everybody said it was. I knew that I could make a difference. I knew that there's lots of opportunity. So I came into energy. Awesome. Yeah, and we're definitely uh, gonna gonna talk a little bit more about that too. About you know what everybody says energy is versus what we all know it to be working uh, in the industry. Um, but uh, first, Larry, I think we'll go over to you next. So in terms of uh, your, your career trajectory, um, you mentioned you're working for a few different consulting firms before you joined TC, um, more or less in the site remediation space. But uh, did you think you'd end up in the energy industry when you uh, started off in environmental science? Yeah, um, well, even before environmental science, I was just kind of like most kids who are kind of, I was drawn to biology and chemistry and I want to be a doctor. And my parents, of course, like any other kid is like, great, be a doctor, you know? <laughs> um, and then after talking to more doctors, I realized firstly, I didn't want to do that much schooling. Secondly, I didn't really want to do night shifts either. That that wasn't uh, really for me. But this, again, I really did still enjoy the biology and the chemistry side. So that kind of drew me to the uh, environmental science uh, stream. And through a co-op, I was kind of introduced into this contaminated sites uh, realm of work. Um, but specifically, I was really drawn to that toxicology side of human health and ecological risk assessment. And uh, I think still it's the fact of my parents working, you know, I was born and raised in Calgary <clears throat> and grown up with the energy uh, industry around me. Um, my parents, they immigrated to Montreal and moved to Quebec or to Alberta, sorry, in the 80s. And through, you know, for them coming as immigrants, they were able to have awesome lives in the oil and gas industry and as well as knowing, you know, what it provides everyone and the benefits to just our daily lives. So um, that was, yeah, again, all, always goes right back to uh, where, where you started from. Um, so that, I guess, came to light when I was graduating of what kind of industry did I want to work in? And I definitely want to stick in Calgary and especially Canada. And the oil and gas industry seemed way more attractive. You know, I could have gone to um, anywhere, like uh, some other industries, such as the chemical production uh, manufacturers like Dow or 3M or something, or um, different pharmaceutical or, or um, our cultural chemical companies, such as like maybe Bayer or Syngenta, but I still thought oil and gas, I think is, um, and just the energy industry is just a way better option. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of us uh, born and bred Calgarians that I think have had it uh, ingrained in us since we were born. Um, yeah, so I get last, last but not least, Sophie, over to you. So I, the, I, I'm curious to see, uh, to hear, to hear what, what uh, your intended path was versus, versus uh, maybe how you got to the CER as someone else who went through business school and was maybe overwhelmed upon graduating with, oh, you can go pretty much anywhere. Um, how did you land on uh, working in energy? Yeah, I, uh, I never planned on working in energy. I think uh, I didn't grow up with it. My parents were not in energy. I don't think I ever really gave it much of a thought. I would, if you had have asked me in university, I was definitely planning on having a more traditional finance role, like being in investment banking or equity research. Um, but I took 
um, I signed up uh, through the University of Lethbridge. They had a uh, internship with Petronas uh, in Malaysia. And so I signed up for that uh, for no other reason than I wanted to go to Malaysia. And I ended up uh, really loving working for Petronas. And I, it was a really interesting internship and, and uh, kind of opened my eyes to how interesting oil and gas could be. I, from a total outsider's perspective, I didn't expect it to be um, as exciting as it is when you're in the industry. And so, uh, yeah, I, when I came back to Canada, I wanted to continue the finance route. I went to the Bank of Canada, um, expecting to kind of leapfrog from there uh, into investment banking. But again, at the Bank of Canada, we really focused on the outlook for the energy sector because it's such a big uh, contributor to GDP, especially in the prairies. That was something we spent a lot of time on. And uh, again, I was just really drawn into um, how interesting the sector is and it's constantly evolving and changing and uh, it's a very dynamic industry. So um, from the bank, I moved into CAP and, and every position I've really had since the Bank of Canada has been through networking. And, and that would, that's really how I've continued in the energy industry is seeing other people and meeting other people and what their jobs are like. And I like that job. So I'm going to follow you because uh, it sounds really interesting. So yeah, I think mine was a little less planned. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And, and hopefully uh, some of our audience members will hear about what, what you folks are doing and go, hey, that, that job sounds cool. I want to go do that. Um, so I, I think next we'll just open the, the rest of this up to the floor uh, versus me uh, uh, pitching any of these questions to you guys specifically. But I do want to talk to a little bit about um, uh, what uh, Mac brought up in terms of maybe wanting to pivot out of energy and, and, uh, and what Andy was talking about. And so there's, there's a bit of a narrative these days in terms of it's energy versus the environment. Um, and, and a lot of uh, the narrative is pitting those two uh, sides against each other. Um, but I think as we've kind of mentioned for a lot of folks working in the energy industry, that's, that's not necessarily exactly what it is. And there's a lot of, um, consideration for environmental uh, impacts. There's a lot of innovation going on on that side of things. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, from each of you kind of, do you feel that um, that conflict in your roles currently? Um, and do you, yeah, mo mostly do you feel that conflict in your roles? Do you wanna go, go Andy? <laughs> or, yeah, Sophie, this is right up your alley. I, I, it's, uh, it's I don't know. I don't know if I call it conflict anymore. I think it used to be conflict. I think it's more of a balance now. Like at the CER, when we're looking at a project and to approve or reject, one of the factors that we consider is, you know, will this project um, affect Canada's ability to meet its environmental obligations and its commitment to climate change? And so, um, it's a balance of increasing energy consumption versus um, these obligations and commitments that we need to meet. Um, but I, I don't, I think it's evolved past conflict to um, overcoming challenges. Like I think what's interesting is that we're seeing um, sustainable finance tools and, and loans and bonds being tied to environmental performance. And we're seeing companies really take it as a way to showcase how they're becoming uh, environmentally um, sustainable and socially sustainable. And we're seeing investments in really interesting technologies, hydrogen, you've got carbon capture. So you're seeing um, less of a push and pull and more of a, an opportunity driven type of environment. It's taking a lot of the people that are actually currently in the industry and creating solutions that provide a better future for our environment. Um, it's similar to what I just brought up actually earlier with that avatar. And Avatar Innovations actually is building an energy transition center right in the heart of downtown Calgary and looking at several hubs across Canada. Um, Avatar takes like a market pulled industry challenges and turns them into business opportunities. And emerging professionals from uh, like Larry over at TC Energy to Andy over at Tyne and you bringing pro like professionals together to work in a cross-functional team to generate new business ideas to, ch to industry, to ch challenge industry and to provide a emerging technology, right? That it, it co correlates with that carbon tech. 
Um, actually, we just started our 12 week program where they're going to be engaging in sessions led by industry and academic experts that range from innovation to entrepreneurship. Um, it's generates either anywhere between, I think, even 10 to 15 groundbreaking breaking initiatives that are usually ready to be taken onto the accelerator program that gets put in front of a bunch of investors. Um, we've teamed up with the Elon Musk Foundation, um, Microsoft, uh, several of the leading uh, producing company or companies in downtown Calgary. So it's those kind of emerging uh, companies that are coming out of Calgary right now that are challenging the industry to be better. Yeah, that's excellent. And lots and, and a lot of innovation around, I guess, uh, solving that problem of, uh, of how does energy work with, with environment in kind of a, um, in a good way, <laughs> instead of in a conflict, as, uh, and as Sophie said, it's, it does seem to be moving past that. Um, and Larry, working closely with Indigenous communities as well, too, right? That you have absolutely. got uh, leading organizations, Indian Resource Council, that's, that's really making a lot of changes and a lot of headway in our industry. And it's, we're coming, we're getting, we're getting there. We're getting yeah. there. Yeah, I was going to contribute to, to uh, um, basically just touch on what Sophie's points were too, where um, so many of, so many companies are based on uh, East, well, rely on ESG investments as well. And so it kind of goes hand in hand where I, I don't feel any of that pressure. Um, and really me doing the right thing is usually involving reducing our environmental liabilities. And that's a huge bonus for TC Energy and for most other companies is what can we do to protect environments? And it's obviously being a great corporate citizen by doing so, as well as reducing any environmental liability or risk of a compliance um, violation. So overall, it's it, it, all energy companies are really advanced on trying to um, pursue environmental stewardship. I'll, I'll just add one thing. There's also tremendous overlap with the economic outcome too. I think there is company that's starting to realize that not only is this the makes the most sense for the environment, but I think this is also makes the most sense from an economic point of view. Um, and we're, we're seeing that a lot with the clients that we deal with that they're you know, ultimately driven both by economics and the environment. And, and there is more overlap than one would, one would initially think. No, perfect. Yeah, that, that's really what I was hoping to say. I said conflict and I was really hoping you were all going to uh, jump in and tell me I was wrong. So that's good. Um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of coming close to uh, to the end. We've got about 10 minutes left here. But um, for, for our audience, I think um, one thing that I definitely don't want to run out of time to say is, is I'm curious what each of you would offer as kind of advice. So for our, our folks that are in high school on the call or um, are in their, their undergraduate degree and trying to figure out exactly where they go from here. Um, what, what advice would you offer somebody who's maybe looking, who, who's maybe heard what you had to say today and is thinking that's the position I want to go and, uh, and work in? I can take the first swing in it. Um, yeah, go for it. I, I'd recommend just, you know, try and reach out. You, you've already taken such a great initiative by attending this talk and trying to listen in. Um, advance your interests and just keep doing that. If, if you don't um, start a LinkedIn profile, try and Google someone who has a job title that you're kind of interested in. And it uh, takes a bit of courage, but just try and message them. And, you know, you might get one person who, who might ignore you. And I apologize for that. But <laughs> I think almost every single professional out there remembers where they started. And, you know, at some point that they had to reach out to other people and seek their advice. And everyone's usually trying to pay it forward. And, um, you know, it, again, if you are reaching out to someone, just be respectful of their time, uh, do a bit of homework in advance and just try and make sure that you're able to ask informed questions and pick their brain and you're not just coming from nothing, but really just really interested in trying to seek their um, advice on some direction that you already have some thought of. Yeah, perfect. And, and it's, uh, it is such a small world in, in the energy sector. Um, I, I'm looking at my screen and as Mac was saying, the, the three bottom people are all involved in, in the avatar program. And that was not intentional. I didn't know it until, uh, until we got on the phone together a couple or uh, last week, uh, to prep for this event. So yeah, absolutely network. Um, it's a small world and there's definitely somewhere out there that can, uh, can give you a hand. Can I, curious, can I add uh, to, the, to yeah. the network thing? I think the network thing is, is, is critical, but I, I, and I remember people telling me to network and I used to get irritated as hell. 
with people telling me to network. And I think it's it's slightly more than I think it needs to be targeted networking. And I think mm. it needs to be, and then I think this has changed with the way careers have gone. It needs to be, you need to be generating content, generate a portfolio, start blogging, podcasting, um, present if you can, start becoming maybe an expert in a particular field that you want to be an expert in. Like these types of things, not just, yeah, networking, but try to generate, um, yeah, a portfolio up and become a, a, an expert in, in something that you have some passion in. That is what I'd add to. And, and I'll maybe put you on the spot, Richard, because I know uh, I know what uh, what you did with your your capstone, but uh, maybe you can give a little bit of specifics to folks because I know oh, you yeah, you shopped your cool. capstone project around quite a bit, and that was a bit of a, a targeted networking uh, yeah, approach for so, you. So it, it's something that you're knowledgeable about, and what I what I did, and it landed me the career I'm, path I'm on right now is 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 selling myself through the work I've done, right, and it's um yeah it, it i had to present i presented to you know groups of people um you know some some small some larger um and then through that i got you know introduced and uh, invited to a different group to just uh, to discuss my my work but it, i think it what it comes down to is if you're interested in, in in transitioning pivoting your career starting a new career start with finding something you're interested in and and, and and working on it, really read, read something and tweet, tweet about it. There's a big, there's a huge Twitter sphere of, of, you know, ESG professionals that, um, that kind of generate thought provoking information. LinkedIn is a great tool. Like those types of things are, um, you can market yourself. Um, and it's not, and it didn't come easy to me because I, I don't, I'm not very good at selling. And now I'm funny enough, my role, part of my role is selling but it, it, it does require selling yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would just uh, add on to that as well. I think the idea of a portfolio as Richard is alluding to is, is extremely important in tech as well. Uh, in fact, um, it's common practice to have uh, a GitHub profile for those that, are, that know what that is. It's basically a place where you can store your coding projects. Um, uh, available to potential employers and you send them like, look at, the, look at this cool thing I did and this is the value it could drive for your, your organization. That says a lot uh, to them that, you know, you took the initiative to do this on your own time and you're clear, you know how to do it and you can apply it to our company as well. Um, I'd also say that um, don't be afraid to, to like, in terms of the targeted networking, like don't like in terms to get people's attention, be a little flashy or, you know, don't, don't be different. Uh, try to catch their attention because, you know, their people will ignore you, as Larry said, but if you make it, it's all in the communication and how you write it and the value proposition you, you give to them as well. And I think you can catch people's attention that way for sure. And, and the last thing I'd say is perhaps if, if you're wary about coming into oil and gas is to change your perspective. I think, I think this relates back to the energy versus industry or sorry, environment versus industry uh, question. I think personally, I see myself as part of the solution and not part of the problem. You know, in reality, uh, think like I'm not, oil and gas is clearly, or oil specifically, gas, whatever, they're not the perfect energy sources, but we're stuck with them for a while. So if you can drive efficiencies in that industry, you're part of the solution. You're making things better, delivering a product uh, in, in a more effective manner. So uh, to make the world a better place in time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think go through, go forward with confidence and try things and build a, build a portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's an important piece too. In in terms of advice, is, is find something you are passionate about and something that does make you uh, feel good at the end of the day. As you said, that you, you're you're part of the solution um, goes a long ways. Yeah, there's kind of like the three pillars I always run off of, which is that perspective, passion, and purpose. So if you find your purpose, you'll know your passion right away, and your perspective changes and creating a solution. And all three of those pillars kind of stuck together. But the one thing I can really push is that that purpose part. Find your purpose and it'll, it'll all fall into place. And don't ever hesitate. I'm opening it up to all the attendees on the line. Do not hesitate to reach out to somebody like myself and see what it's like. I will always have the time of day for you. So, yeah, just reach out and kind of get to know what's going on. But find that purpose. Um, I'll just uh, finish it off with for I know 
in economics or finance, my biggest thing I would say is be able to speak to what people in your field are excited for and want to talk about. So like I know for us, like the Oil Sands Pathway Alliance, like that's really exciting right now. Like be able to speak to that, be able to speak about sustainable bonds or sustainable loans and the energy companies that are managing to uh, to get this sort of financing tool and renewable natural gas and hydrogen. These are all projects that um, people in the industry want to talk about. And so being up to date on those trends is, is going to help you stand out when you're doing that networking. Excellent. Well, I, uh, I can't believe it, but we are actually already at time. Um, I think we could go on for, for another hour, but uh, I want to say thank you to all of you. Um, really appreciate it. And I'm sure our audience got uh, a lot out of today's conversation. So thank you again. And I'll pass it back to Justin to, uh, to carry on.